Good evening, ghoulies and ghosties and long-leggedy beasties. This is Alex, coming at you from the underworld, and welcome back to another episode of... I cannot believe it. A year has already passed and my channel is officially one year old. And in that time, I've received about 340 subscribers, which I want to say thank you to everyone, especially the booktuber Shades of Orange, because she was gracious enough to give me a shout out on her channel. And I just really want to thank everyone for their shares, their likes, their correspondences. It's just something that really makes me feel good, and I really do appreciate each and every one of you. But before I get too sentimental, I just... Happy birthday to you, too. Oh. All right, well, I'm glad there's not a candle on this, because I ain't falling for what you did on my birthday. That just... That, uh, that was wrong, and I'm just so glad that you actually gave me a cupcake chin. <laughs> Oh, well, aside from needing a new assistant, let's go on and get down to the book I'm going to review this weekend, which is The Howling Three. And pretty much, I really hate that this series is over because I did enjoy it. It was a lot of fun. But hey, all good things must come to an end. And if you've seen The Howling Three movie, just know that the book has nothing in common with the movie whatsoever. And even though the movie was pretty crappy, I did enjoy it. It was fun. But without me rambling anymore, let's go on and get down to what made the beast perk its ears up in 1985. The Howling Three by Gary Brandner is a book that could honestly stand on its own because it takes the characters and scenarios from the first two books and throws them out the back door, which because of this, we are presented a whole new storyline with book three. So in this regards, the new plot focuses on a town that is nearby Drago, where the town sheriff one day finds an abandoned boy in the woods by the name of Malcolm. So the sheriff takes Malcolm to the local hospital where Malcolm undergoes the care from Dr. Holly Lang, who is a clinical psychologist. And in a small amount of time, the two of them form this really tight bond. But the doctor also discovers that Malcolm has some qualities about him that might not be entirely human. So because of this, there's another doctor on site by the name of Dr. Pastori, who underhandedly takes Malcolm away from Dr. Lang. And because of this, his actions result in a trail of nothing but dead bodies. So now it's up to Dr. Lang to get Malcolm back into her custody so she can tame the beast within. The Howling Three was published in 1985 and was also known as The Howling Three Echoes. And while it has nothing in common with the 1987 movie adaptation The Marsupials, a good portion of this book regards Malcolm being in a freak show. Which, this is much like the character in the movie The Howling Six, The Freaks. However, this was not the first time a werewolf was portrayed in a freak show. Instead, that concept was first used in the British movie Legend of the Werewolf. Fun Facts Well, unfortunately, I wasn't able to really find too many facts out about The Howling Three, so for this segment, I'm just going to explain the differences between the third book and the rest of the trilogy. At the end of book one, Chris and Karen burn down Drago during their escape. However, with Book 3, it ignores that fact and establishes Drago was burnt down by angry people from the neighboring village. And while Books 1 and 2 are set in the 70s, it's pretty blatant that Book 3 takes place in the mid-80s, which, due to the time frame that Book 1 and 2 established, this presents a huge continuity era in regards to when Chris and Karen originally burnt down Drago. Also, there is a change in the style of Werewolf, as Book 3 is the only one of the trilogy to give the Werewolf its creature feature vibe. And while on this subject, in the first two books of this trilogy, the Werewolves can only change after sundown, whereas in Book 3, they can change whenever they want, especially if they get mad. 
Unfortunately, I wasn't able to find why Brandner decided to make the drastic changes that he did. So if anyone can provide insight on that, I would appreciate it. Now that we have that out of the way, it's time to move on to the spoilers section of this video, which if you've never read this book before, I'm about to reveal some things that could ruin the experience for you. So if you wish to skip this segment, just scroll down to the comment section of this video and you'll see that I have a pinned comment at the top. If you click on the link that I have provided in that comment, you'll see that the timestamp will direct you to the thoughts section of this video. Now you only have 17 seconds to do this, so ready, set, go! Since everyone's had the opportunity to click away, I want to talk about two of my favorite kill scenes and also how the ending of this book just felt like it was a disappointment. But before I get to the bad news, I do want to talk about some of my favorite moments, which the first one that comes to mind is the death of Abe. Now, what you need to know about Abe is, he is some backwoods trash who totally deserves what he gets. And in this regards, he's shacked up in a cabin with a journalist because he had seen a werewolf and the journalist is hoping to get a good story out of him, so the journalist is really kissing his ass. But what the men don't realize is a werewolf has followed them to the cabin, and when the journalist goes into town to get some goods for Abe, Abe is left behind where he starts to hear some noises outside the cabin. So he goes to the peephole on the front door to look through and see what he can find, and when he does, he sees this wolfish green eye looking back at him. And this scene just creeped me the hell out because had I been him, I would have shit all over myself because that's like one of my phobias looking out of a peephole and seeing an eye look back at me. But what happens next is the werewolf busts up in the cabin, it disembowels Abe, then bites him in the head, and this is all while Abe is still alive. So it was pretty cool, and Abe was an asshole, so I totally felt like this was a moment I could cheer for. And don't get me wrong, I really felt like the death scene in regards to Dr. Quaylen was good too, but something about the cabin sequence just works better. Now, my second favorite kill moment is when Dr. Pastori finally dies. And what you need to know about this guy is, he never does one good thing throughout the entirety of the book. And when he finally died, I was like, all is right with the world. Because what happens here is Malcolm gets away from Dr. Pastori and he joins a freak show where the owner of that freak show by the name of Bateman treats Malcolm like a son. Well... Sadly, of course, this is shortly lived because Dr. Pastori hunts him down and tries to buy Malcolm off of Bateman, but Bateman ain't having it, so this pisses off Pastori, and he strangles Bateman to death. Well, Malcolm sees this from the curtain he's hiding behind, and the rage of seeing his father figure die causes him to transform into the werewolf. So he steps out from behind the curtain, and what's kind of funny here is you have where Pastori has this Napoleon complex, so even though he's confronted with this beast, he's still trying to delegate to it what they're going to do next. But the beast ain't having it, so he goes over to Pastori, rips his throat out, and then carries him off like a dead duck. And I really loved how the humor of this mixed with the horror. It just, it totally worked. But with my favorite scenes aside, it's now time to talk about the ending and how it just felt rushed. So here's the thing. I think Brandner perhaps had a deadline he had to meet, so he was scrambling to meet that deadline, and that's why everything is just summed up within a very small amount of time. And throughout the book, we do see where an epic battle is going to take place, but when the battle comes, it's between Derek and Malcolm, and I'm expecting this is going to last four paragraphs on because they're both werewolves. Well, Brandner sums it up that the fight lasted for an hour, and then Malcolm ripped out Derek's throat, and as Malcolm was dying, he crawls over to Dr. Lang, which she pets him as he breathes his last breath, and that's the end of the book. So, I really was disappointed because I really grew to love these characters, and I was expecting to have a lot more go down at the end of this book, 
which it just did not happen. And I truly think that had Brandner had a little bit more time to write, this could have been expanded out for pages perhaps, but of course that didn't happen. And I do elaborate on this a little bit more in the thoughts section, so until we get to that moment, let's go on and have some tea. Dr. Pastore is the kind of person where if he was in front of me, I would put my hands down in his pants and grab those two little raisins that he calls balls, and one would be in each hand where I would just cup them like this, and then I'd just bang them the hell together like that. But you know what? He doesn't exist. He's not in front of me. I can't do that. But I can bitch about him here. And let me tell you, out of all of the characters in this series, this douchebag here is what takes the cake. Because let me spell it out for you. First off, he takes Malcolm away from Dr. Lang, and this is only because he wants to exploit Malcolm. It doesn't matter that Malcolm was in a good place with her. And he goes about this by not filing the correct paperwork also, so he illegally takes Malcolm away from her. And then when he gets Malcolm to his, like, private clinic, he ends up putting the boy in a cage when he's not around, and then you have his assistant who just abuses the shit out of Malcolm. And it just is never ending with this asshole from start to finish, especially at the end when he ended up killing Malcolm's father figure. And it's just when he died, I was happy. I was so, so damn happy. And the reason why I say he is the worst out of everyone in this series, if he would have just left Malcolm where he was, Malcolm would have remained in a good place and none of this shit would have gone down. Even though the ending of The Howling 3 is as rushed as what it is, I honestly think that this is my favorite book out of the trilogy. Now, before I get on to, like, the themes and the characters, I do want to comment on why I think the ending of this book was as rushed as what it was. And I have no proof on this, and so this is just me speculating, but if you have any proof one way or another, please load it up in the comments because I'm just curious. But when I see an ending like this, I tend to think that the author had a deadline they need to meet, and they did what was necessary to get the book to their publisher. And I say this because when I did the video for the Howling 2 book review, I had mentioned in my story behind the story segment that Gary Bradner had actually worked on the screenplay for the Howling 2 movie. And because of the complications he had with the producers of that movie, he was forced to do multiple rewrites, and this took away from his career as an author. And it eventually came to the point where he told the producers that he had to bow out because he had a deadline with a book. And even though he never said what that book was, when I did my research, I saw that the book of The Howling 3 and the movie of The Howling 2 were released in the same year of 1985. So, you know, that's just me drawing a conclusion there. But uh, with that said, let's go on and move on to the themes, which the first theme I noticed in this was gender discrimination. And this comes about because of how Dr. Holly Lang is treated by her colleagues at the hospital. Now, another theme I noticed was I really feel like this book is a coming-of-age horror story, and that's more so because of the character Malcolm. And I really feel like maybe even Brandner used the werewolf as a metaphor to comment on how teenagers feel and how their bodies change during those teenage years, because we see a lot of aloneness, a lot of fear, and just a lot of confusion with Malcolm. And I mean, hell, those were my teenage years. So I really tend to think that the werewolf is a metaphor for coming of age in this book. And as far as the characters go, I really love the characters in this series because they just really feel fun and I can connect with them. But truth be it, the characters in book three honestly feel like they were the best of this trilogy. Like, I was able to just instantly connect with their problems and I felt for them so much more than I did the characters in the previous books. So I really feel like Brandner upped the ante with his characters here. And overall, I wasn't scared or grossed out by the book, but it did keep me on the edge of my seat, and I was interested from start to finish, 
and there were actually a few times that I was really creeped out when reading this. At the end of the day, The Howling 3 really does to the series what Halloween 3 did to the Michael Myers franchise. So for that reason, if you have already read the first two books, you don't have to read this one. Or if you haven't read the first two books, you can read this and not be lost whatsoever because this is a really good standalone. Now, as I said, my only complaint about this was how the ending was rushed, but other than that, I love the characters, the concept was also fun, and we finally get the creature feature vibe from the werewolf that the first two books had been lacking. So, if you feel like you can deal with a rushed ending, this is still a fun creature feature horror novel to read, so I do recommend it. Also, for the completest out there, when you put all three books together, it forms this image here. So, that is pretty friggin' sweet. And yes, I am a completist. So, even before I had read the entirety of the series, I had all three books. And when you put them together, it makes this horde of werewolves. So, that's pretty cool. On to the questions. My first question is, what is a horror book you would recommend that's also a coming-of-age story? Load up the comments. My second question is, how do you feel when you're reading a good book, but the end of that book becomes rushed and it's over before you know it? Personally, if the book was good, I don't mind a rushed ending. I do feel like I am somewhat cheated, though, because I was expecting the ending to be more fleshed out. But as long as everything's wrapped up, it's okay. But if I was reading something like a slow burner and the ending of this book was going to make or break everything I read, then that could totally be problematic. But that's just my opinion. And I would like to see what everyone else feels about that subject, so load up the comments on that. And now that we have that out of the way, it's time to go in and close out the video, which before I do, I would like to say thank you to Lisa G, Joseph Baylot, and Melody Romeo, which Melody Romeo is an author who writes fantasy and historic fiction. So if you're interested in those genres, be sure to check her out because you can get her ebooks and print wherever books are sold. And if you're wondering why I'm giving a shout out to these wonderful people, it's because they've been kind enough to contribute to my Patreon account, and for $5 a month, I'll give you a shout out at the end of my videos, which if you are a creator, I'll also note what you do next to your name so people can find you and hunt you down online. And if you would like to do the $10 tier option, pretty much I'll still give you that shout out at the end of my videos, but once a month at the beginning of every month, I'll send you over one of my photos, which I do creepy photography on the side. And from there, you're welcome to print it, do whatever you want with it, the photo's yours. So if you can do that, that's awesome. If not, that's cool too. I just hope you return to this channel so we can continue to have fun. And if you would like to hit me up on social media, links for my Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok are all in the description section of this video. And if you haven't subscribed yet, be sure to subscribe and click that notifications bell because I have tons of more book reviews coming in the near future. So until we see each other again, I hope you have a great week and sweet nightmares.